Hi, welcome to Give Your Wall Some Soul. I'm Shannon Grissom. This is the live to tape painting show so that you get a good idea of real time of what a painting experience is like. Last time on Give Your Wall Some Soul, we painted Big Willie. He's a Bernese mountain dog. And I wanted to bring him back again this week so you can see what he looks like finished. Didn't do a whole heck of a lot after I got um, out of the studio. I glazed him a little bit, reinstated by, what I mean by reinstating is I touched up his lights and darks to really make him pop. And I uh, did a little glazing of some red over his tongue. But for the most part, he was, he was pretty well done when we were last on the show. So that was Willie. And what we're gonna do this week is cherries. And these cherries, uh, I got them out at Casa de Fruta. They have incredible fruit right now. And uh, of course, you know I love to paint fruit. This is not so much about painting the fruit as today we're gonna talk a lot about composition, interstitial space. Some people call it negative space, but I prefer interstitial. And uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you can see by the reference photo of the cherries, there are three distinct shapes. I'm going to start by blocking in just an outline so you can get an idea of where we're going to go with this. I'm just going to do a light drawing so you can see where this is headed. We've got a triangular shape here that the stem creates. Another, you can see this is really, and why am I using purple? Uh, I'm using purple, it doesn't really matter what color I'm using, I'm using it simply because I liked it. It's a nice neutral backdrop. I'm putting in the stems, see these are forming triangles, putting them in very lightly, just to give myself a map of where, where everything's supposed to go. Why did I pick a square canvas? The three cherries together really fit well on I, I, I have painted them also on a rectangular canvas I really like the composition and the tension that you get on a square and once I get the basic outline and you know that the shadow part is just as important to the basic shape of what you're painting and the basic composition as the item itself. So we've got that. The shadow goes like this. Let's see. The shadow started about right here. Okay, so now we have a basic idea of where we're going with this. I think that I had it drawn here, but I think it needs to have a little something happening over here. That's the nice thing about painting. You can improvise and change things. OK, so when we're talking about composition. There are a lot of triangles within this square of a painting. We have a triangular shape here. So we're not necessarily looking at these round shapes here. We're also looking at the shapes in between. So in this interstitial space, you have a triangle here, here, and uh, you got to be careful of where these triangles are pointing to. When, whenever you start to look at your painting and you notice that you have triangles, where are they pointing? If they're pointing off the canvas, then you're going to lose the viewer. However, these, because of the tension, and these stems do provide tension. I, I, when I pose these, and I pose these cherries, you didn't just throw them on the table. Sometimes you can throw them out like dice and they land great and you can just paint them that way. But um, you, more often than not, you've got to arrange them. And so I actually separated these so that there was a clump here and a clump here, and that there's actually a tension of going down from these branches here, or branches, these little tiny stems. They look like branches when you paint them this big. And so there's a lot of tension here, and you can tell that this is a lot looser. So there's just this fluid motion here. The other thing is it brings you back. Because this is a loose fluid motion, this brings you back. So everything brings you back to the middle of the composition. OK, so enough about that. You're probably bored with that part of it. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and start painting the background. 
it's a good place to start. I thought about starting with the shadow this time, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this big area covered first. The reason I'm doing it first, I'm mixing some white. Now I've changed the background. If you look at the reference photo, it's sitting on a, it was a wooden TV tray. And uh, that, that's just not, I, I really wanted the sense of space and I really didn't want that color to be on the background. So that's why I decided to just paint it with a, a white, very neutral background. I'm adding, I want it to be warm, it's in sunlight, so I'm adding some cad yellow deep to the white mixture. And of course I'm going to use a lot of medium, make it really thin so that I can scrub in a lot really quickly. I'm using a flat brush. Um, well, it was flat, but it's seen so much use it almost looks like a filbert, but a flat brush is typically straight across. So I'm dipping the brush in a lot of medium. And I'm going to scrub it in. Hardly looks like I'm doing anything at this point. It's not going to make a huge difference. I see a little bit of yellow there. I'm going to add a little bit of that just for interest. I will add more color to the background later, but this is a good start. And I'm scribbling in crisscrossy strokes because that will add interest too. There are times when you want to keep your strokes pointed down toward the object. At this point, I want a sense of space, and so I don't think that that's necessary. I don't need to direct traffic that way. But there are times when you do need to do that. So you know, if you use a brush that's too small, it would take you forever to cover this amount of canvas. Got to use more medium. That's a great sound. One of my favorite sounds is to hear the, the brush fur furiously hitting the canvas. When you're in a room together with several people painting and you hear the brush hitting the canvas, it's just a happy sound. You notice that a lot of the paintings that I do tend to be one single object on a very neutral background like Willie. In this case, these, this group of cherries is acting like one single object. There are places where I haven't covered the canvas totally in the background and I'm okay with that. I'm picking up a little yellow, that's going to add some interest. You could almost treat this like a watercolor and leave the background white. But I really like the warmth of the paint. And the shadows will make more sense if it's got some yellow in the background. Sometimes what I do is I'll take the painting and turn it upside down so it's easier to, or sideways, so it's easier to get the bottom. I need some more medium. The medium makes the paint go thinner, helps it dry faster, and for the initial coat, I want it to do both of those things. It also, if you scrub it in over the pencil lines, it erases the pencil lines pretty well.
We've done shows where I painted the almost the entire painting upside down. We may do that again, but not today. Okay, that's pretty much where all the light is in the background. Got it covered. So I'm going to turn the canvas over again. And make sure I get some of the paint off my hands. Okay, so the next, the next plan of attack is, okay, where, what else do I want to get started on? Sometimes I can save the uh, stems for last. I didn't, want, I didn't want to put the stems in first and then have to paint the background around those. So that's why I went ahead and I actually put some of the paint, I mean, right up to that or even over the stems. You don't want to have to be that careful. First of all, it would look like you were that careful in the painting. That's when some of those look like they're plastered on. And for me, it's simply not as fun to have to be that careful. Okay, so the stem even needs, needs to have form. Even though it's a tiny little thing, it's still got to have a dark, medium, and light in order for it to look three-dimensional. I don't have any black on the palette today. I, if you look at the palette, it's, it's made up of a lot of primary colors. We're going to mix those so that they aren't what I call shockers. But uh, we'll, we'll do some mixing right on the canvas today. Okay, the shadow side of the stem is dark. So I'm going to go ahead and put this purple in. Let's see. I'm not just doing a straight line when I go ahead and put the paint down. If I were to put a straight line, it would be boring, and again, it would look pasted on. So I'm kind of moving my brush from side to side so that it jiggles a little and becomes irregular. Not quite sure how far I'm going to go with this thing, but I'll, I'll put it there and see what happens. And then I'm going to put dark on all three sides. So it's hitting right here. Where else is the dark hitting? It's right there. These kind of just touch. I find myself trying do, doing a straight line, and I have to stop myself from doing that. It's a natural thing to want to make it tidy. Okay, now for a mid-tone, what we can do is actually use a cad red light. I'm going to use that with my dirty brush that I used the purple on, and I'll brush mix this. Okay. So this is forming a medium dark. Let's see, where does that stem do? I'm breaking it up. If you have a straight line, again, it's very boring and very unnatural. There are ridges in these little stems. I can't remember the variety of these cherries. They were really interesting looking. They have the yellow and red on them instead of just straight red. So I thought they'd be fun to paint. They were good to eat, that's for sure. And what I did was I, I took photographs of these. The weather was hot, and I knew they, they weren't going to last that long. so. I took photographs, got the thing sketched out, and uh, then we ate, we ate the still life. OK, this actually kind of crosses. That could be a little awkward in there. But we'll have to work on that later. 
Okay, to make another light, a lighter tone, I'm going to go ahead and add. Now, it doesn't look like there's much difference yet, but there will. I'm going to add a little bit of cad yellow deep. Again, I'm not, I'm not even, well, I might just clean this brush off a little bit. I'm not dipping it in anything. I'm just going to wipe it off. Go straight into the cad yellow deep. It's cad yellow deep. You'd think you'd be getting yellow, but it really looks orange. And that's going to go next. Now, do I really see these colors in the stem? Nope. It just kind of looks uh, brown and olive to me. But I know that these will work. My palette, I like the warmer colors. Why is this working? Because I have a dark, medium, and light, and I'm going from warm to cool. So the cool is the violet. Then you've got this red that's, that's almost cool for a red, considering. And then a warm cad yellow deep. And I'm just going to take that progressively until we get. See, now this, need, this brush needs to be wiped off, because what's happening is, is I'm making mud. There's a time for mud, and this isn't it. There's also times when I'll be painting and I try to correct a, a mistake or something that I don't think I should be doing and I go back in and do the same thing over and over and over. I'd re <laughs> it's, it's amazing how you, it's just a natural place or thing that you want to do to the canvas and it, sometimes it's a struggle to fight against what, what you're trying to do. Okay, I think we could even push it a little more and uh, use some cad yellow light next to it. So, so far, we've had the doxazine purple, cad red light, cad yellow deep, and cad yellow light. So, who would have thought there were all these colors in the stem? I'm not using a a skinny little round brush. I'm actually using, you can see that this is a flat headed, it's a flat brush. So it's squared off at the top and uh, it gives you a nice little line. You can, ch you can really chisel things in. Okay, now I need to actually add a white or a really light, light color there on the edge to make that pop, which is going to be interesting against that dark background. So I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to achieve a uh, dark background, light background. I'm not in, sure if I'm going to be able to achieve that, but I'm going to try. So you could almost use the background white. I'm going to add this Indian yellow. Now, if you look at just the amount of Indian yellow that I have on this palette knife, for the most part, it's just white with just a, on the very tip, there's a little bit of Indian yellow. That color is so powerful when you put it on the, on the knife that it's going to take over. So look what it does to this color, just a touch of it. See how yellow that makes that compared to this white that's right here? So that's why I only use a little bit. You will get to know after mixing and mixing and mixing what, what colors are going to take over and what colors are just kind of going to hang back. You'll notice I wipe my knife a lot to keep it from contaminating other colors. OK, at this stage, I'm getting a different brush. 
because I need to keep these colors clean. So the light side of the stem I'm putting this on a little thicker than I would but that's the only way it's going to pop right now. I'm going to have to keep wiping this brush because it keeps getting contaminated with other colors in order for this to work. This is one of those that uh, after I got home and the paint dried, we talked about reinstating the lights on Willie. That's what I would do. I would reinstate the lights on the edge of this. You know, it's starting to look like a stem. can always tell when I go too far without wiping my brush. It starts making mud, and I've got to kind of do it over again. Now, I made the one mixture, but if you notice, I keep going back and forth between the two different whites, and that helps it give, give it some character. If you have the same color everywhere, it's just boring. I like to surprise people. I like people to go, wow, you know, to look at something and really appreciate that it's there. But so, wow, you put this surprise color in there and it really works. I push it a lot. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it really bombs. And the only way you know is just keep trying. Okay, as far as the, uh, I could keep futzing with this stem right now, but I think I need to leave it alone. Start working on the rest of the painting. One other thing that I would do to help this, these stems look a little more three-dimensional is take a brush and blend it. But I think I'm going to wait till the very end before I do that, see what kind of time that we have. All right, so when you take a look at the shadows, um, when you photograph something, I know the color that the shadows really were as opposed to the, the color that you see in the reference photograph. In the reference photograph, the shadows look really, really dark. And um, while there was a huge contrast, there's n they weren't nearly that dark in person. And there was a lot more red in the shadows than is evident there. So I'm going to play that up. Normally, you know, people would start with the cherries, but I'm going to go ahead and start with the shadows. First, I need to clean a little space off on my palette so that I have room to mix some color. And I'm just going to move the whites over to the side. I might even just use those. So what am I going to add to that to make it a nice gray with some red in it? Well, first I'll go ahead and add a little bit of this cad red that we had here, cad red light. Now I added a little bit of that, and that just made it very peach, very pink. And uh, that's not going to work. So what do I need to do to, to gray it down? Well, it's complement would be this ultramarine blue. That's getting there. That's better. It's still too pink. Peachy. Yuck. Turning more violet. I'm just smashing this. OK, I've mixed. Ooh, actually, that's actually a pretty good sh shadow color there. Now, this seems fairly light. 
So I'm going to add, I know that in the shadows, it always picks up the complement of the color of the object that's casting the shadow. So in this case, the cherries are red. They're, for the most part, they've got some yellow in them. I'm going to add a little bit of green to them. Well, maybe I added too much. We'll see how this works. You know what? That's a good start. I'm going to use this for the base shadow and add some other colors later. Moving to a softer brush. This almost seems like it's a little too light. We'll see how it looks when I put it down on the canvas. That's not bad. I sound surprised. I am surprised. <laughs> I'm adding a little violet to this. I'm already, you know, not messing with it. Ah, a little more red, a little violet. This will be a good base, and then I can add some color later. When you're doing a first statement and you're just trying to get the canvas covered, I do basic shapes, block it in, and then I go ahead and add color over the top. So I'm going to make the shadow, even though the shadow is not one color, I'm going to make it one color. If we have time to play with it later, I will. If not, it'll still read. What do I mean by reading? It, you'll still be able to tell what's going on. You'll get a sense of shape and form, space. This brush is too small for the space I'm using. That would take forever. Getting a bigger brush. like that. Doesn't make sense without the object, but it will. I do hope we get that far, because one thing about shadows is that in the middle, the edges are a lot darker. And in the middle, there's a lot of light bouncing off in there. So I'd like to put that in. I did a series of uh, motorcycles, tricycles, and one of my favorite things about these paintings, they were done in this manner on a, a simple background with shadow, and one of my favorite things about the paintings, sure, I like, I like painting the chrome on the motorcycle, but I really like playing with the shadows. forget where I was and somebody asked me, how do you know how much paint to mix? And I, I think I remember saying that uh, I've not made enough paint enough times that when you make that mistake enough times, you, you kind of get a good idea of how much to mix. Okay, now let's get some cherries blocked in. Again, I always, you know, I'm going to tidy up one little spot here first because that's bugging me. And also, if I don't if I don't scrub away the pencil line now, it would be hard to cover it up later. Okay. Well, back to, where was I? Back to, start with what you know you can do first. And um, normally, and I've heard this before on, uh, from my teacher and other painting shows that you, the first thing you see is the last thing you paint. So if you're talking about Willie, the highlight on his nose would be the last thing you paint. 
if you're talking about this, the highlight on the cherries is the last thing you paint. And that's a great rule. And once you know the rule, then you can do it your own way. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and overstate the highlights on these cherries. And that way, I won't run into them. So I know that uh, there's, there's a big old light blob there. I'm making it way bigger than it is. And you know what? I uh, need some more white. You notice I'm not using straight white. I've added a little bit of yellow because if the sun's hitting it, that, that highlight is going to be warm. OK, so it kind of goes around and behind there. Also, if you don't like the way a highlight hits, you, can, you don't have to paint it in. OK, there's one there. Again, making it way bigger than it actually is. There's one here. And an another thing, if you put it behind the stem, it's going to help it give some space. So you think something is going on back there. So there. And that. OK. Now I'll go ahead and put the darks in. So I'm not going, not going uh, I'm almost going across the board. I'm not doing just lights. I'm putting lights and darks in. And I'll go ahead and put the medium stuff in later. Again, purple is a great color to use with red. So this is really kind of sunk in here. So we, wanna, we want it to look like it's just coming down in here. And there's some dark back hair. And this can't just be sticking out of nowhere, so that's got to be in a little hole. This is actually behind this, so we'll leave that there. Where else is it dark? Right here. And you'd think that it would be dark at the bottom where it's hitting this, but not necessarily. There's a lot of reflected light there. So if you're putting in reflected light, it has to be a little bit cooler because it's not light coming from the sun. So I'm adding a little blue to that. And I'm going to put a little reflected light down in here. And I see a little down here. All right. Now we'll go with the darker red. I used to mix every single color painstakingly. As you can see now, I do a lot of mixing on the canvas. Either way is good. One advantage to pre-mixing your colors is that you are consistent and you can tell before you ever hit here whether you have it right. But for somebody like me who doesn't have a lot of patience, this seems to work out really well. Oh, that's a nice, rich dark right there. like that. OK, so the right side of the cherry, this is shadow side. And I'm going to go ahead and be consistent and put that on the others. The one that's out front here isn't quite as dark as everything that's back there. Where else is it dark? There's kind of a little. Uh, Hmm. Looks like a little chin on the cherry. OK, let's see. I have to lighten that up a little now. There's a little bit of light right here. That doesn't look like it's any different. I probably should have wiped my brush, but I didn't. Let's see if we can rectify that. Add some, yeah, a little too. A little too red. This side also needs to be, what I'm doing is I'm looking for spots of color. That's not light enough. I should have cleaned my brush. So I'm going to move on to another one. I 
you know, I can get on a roll doing the wrong thing and it's kind of like Jim Carrey where somebody stopped me. So what I do is I stop myself and move on to another item and that helps me break the rhythm and go, okay, I need to be over here doing something different. It's amazing how I can run amok. But at least I know how to catch myself. Okay, this brush is so muddy that it's uh, only going to be good for a couple more passes and I'm going to need to use another one. Yeah. Let's grab. This is a good scrubbing brush. It's, it used to be a filbert. It didn't used to be at a point like this, but uh, it's well worn, well used. I love it. Going straight into some of this yellow. So what I'm seeing is some light here. These cherries really did have this color. Well, maybe I turned it up a little bit, but might need to lighten it up a bit. That's the other thing. Some of these colors are opaque. Some of them are transparent. So I need to really work with the ones. If they are transparent, they should go on later, not, not this early. OK, this is light hair. Now I can go ahead and put some of these orangey colors in. Got to make sure that I'm not doing anything too pinky, peachy. Yeah, that's better. So you'll notice that, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever saw the first show where I did the grapes, and it was kind of like lug nuts where I was all over. I wasn't just finishing one grape. By the time the whole thing is, is through, I'll have all of the cherries covered. But I'm going basically for, if I see this spot over here, do I see it over here? Then I'll put it in here. And I keep going all around until I get the whole thing covered. A little lighter here. Not sure that these two are happy together, but we'll work on that. A little bit darker here, so that's good. This is really just lots of red, so I need to not mess with that one. Go ahead and put in some of the CAD. I'm gonna, this one has white, this brush has white on it, so it's not, it's gonna make the reds really too pinky. You gotta be careful of pink reds where you don't want them. Okay, that's better. This is a nice warm red hair. Going to have to cool it off a little bit. Need some more medium to help that paint flow. One thing that might be fun to try is to get an egg timer at home, the kind that go tick, 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 tick. Set it for an hour and see what you can get done. When you've got that kind of pressure and you've got that rhythm going tick, 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 you've got a lot more expression happening in your painting than when you're just really leisurely about it. Oh, that's nice. Those two reds are happy together. It's important that reds be happy. Important that all colors be happy. But reds, when they're not, they really shout. It's like hitting a really bad note, like a squeak on a clarinet. Okay. What's going to make this look three dimensional when I'm through? The dark, medium, and light. That's really happy. I love this combination. I love this purple and red together. Okay. That needs to be darker, cooler, not just darker, but cooler, right here. I'm neglecting this one over here. It's got some interesting darks and lights. That's happy. I need 
to leave that one alone for a minute. Okay, if I put the same color here, there's going to be no separation. So I need to go a lot lighter. I need to change the brush because this one's too contaminated. I'm going to do a red. You have to add orange or yellow to a red to make it lighter. If you're going to add white, otherwise it's going to be real pink. And we can't have pink here. Okay, that gives the separation. Where does this go? Does it go past the stem? Actually, I think the stem should be bigger. So I'm putting that in. So I actually went down into this, and even though the cherry is covering that up, I'll go back over the top. I have a darker color. There, that's better. I like the ruggedness of this, so I have to try and um, leave it alone. All right, it's going to need to be lighter again in order for this to read. You're going to have to have light on both sides of the highlights. That's what helps it turn. By turn, I mean give it form. Okay, I can put some darker red in there. So I've got warm and cool reds here going. Red is typically a warm color, but, but within the red family, you'll notice on the outside these are cool and then it gets warmer. And I'm going to kind of brush mix this. Need to be a little lighter. What's going on over there? It's kind of dark. I have to step back and look and see where I'm doing. Okay, I basically I've got a mirror set up so that I can step back and see if these things are starting to take shape. They're getting there. So um, if when I'm really up close, I have no idea what my paintings are doing. And in the studio at home, I paint looking and I paint and I've got a mirror right here. So if you see me turning like that, that's basically what I'm doing. Okay, you know, it's interesting how that has that yellow red down at the bottom here. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so in order for that to work, give me a little lighter here. Not much value change there, so that's not going to work. And sometimes it is a case of temperature, and by that I mean warm or cool rather than value. Light or dark. See, it goes from warm, a little bit cooler. I might have to reinstate that. Uh, it needs to be darker over there. Do I use a brush that's contaminated? Yeah. Toward the end of the painting session, all my painting gets contaminated. OK. That, that looks better. Kind of went overboard. I do that sometimes. What else am I seeing? Down there is not that. Now, now, it's, now it's a matter of keeping the brushes straight, <laughs> not using the wrong one. Yeah, I still think it needs to be lighter. <clears throat> Again, with the reference photo, there are things you know and things you see. And I looked at these, I looked at this setup a long time. 
before I even decided to paint it to see what, what are these cherries doing. Okay, this has to be lighter. That's a huge, my God, as far as that highlight. I really went overboard on that so I can cut it down. And I think if I add a little bit of light there. Now I think I might be able to, uh, it looks pretty scribbled right now. I might be able to take a brush and blend it a little bit and get some, start to get some form. So I'm, what am I looking for? I keep picking through these brushes. I'm looking for something that's stiff. This one looks good. It's trash. It's my, my blending brush that I use forever. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just brush. I, need, I might need some more paint right here. This might make a good little blending brush, except it does have paint already on it. See, I changed my mind. At first, I was blending in, a, in uh, the motion that goes, now I'm blending in a circular motion. That also helps. If you go against the form, that also helps give it form. I start going with the form and then against the form. So with the form would be this way and then back. I think this has too much paint on it, so I definitely need to wipe my brush a little bit. Maybe I'll use this one that I started out with. So it's one of those cases where you have to blend and wipe repeatedly. And I keep looking in the mirror to see whether this is working or not. It's getting softer, it's getting more form, that's nice. It's a good start. And this late in the program, I want to at least get the other three to a point so that you can, now you can start to see how this one is getting a sense of space, a sense of form. The shadow definitely needs to be a little darker, it's, it's a little too light. But it's, it's starting to become something. I want to go ahead and do that with these other two. And then if time allows, which hopefully I can whip this out, uh, we'll be able to darken the shadows just a little bit. So I'm blending here, not adding any more paint. Carefully blend and wipe. So first I'm going with the form. I'll go against it once I get this covered. Keep checking in the mirror to see if that's working. Yep. Okay, on my reference photo, what does that do over there? It's dark right there. It's dark and it's cool. That's what I'm asking myself in my head. What does it do? Is it lighter or darker? Is it cool? Is it warm? Oh, that's nice. So these strokes are going out. This is going to need a See, it's good to, to put down some strokes with some passion. It adds some energy to the piece. Okay. 
Okay. That needs to be blended a little bit better. I think I need a different brush though. Didn't wipe it very well, so I'm definitely gonna have to reinstate these lights later. But that's what happens. I have to put the lights in back again over the top after it dries. Because I blended away all the cool stuff that was happening. Okay, so what am I going to do with this one? It's, it's in pretty good shape. Uh, I'll add a little bit of orange. Cad yellow deep. Wipe the brush. Scrub this one along. Now in order for this little indentation to work, you got to have dark against light. Well, that was pretty pitiful. Got to put some paint on your brush. So there's the light. Then put the dark back over the top. Okay, now we'll just blend that. I'll get uh, yet an even cleaner brush because this had a lot of subtle lights. I hope you can hear that I am scrubbing this in together. Okay, am I done with these? No, but I need to, you know, we're, we're getting short on time, and I need to land these cherries. Right now they're, they've got shadows, but they pretty much look like they're floating. So I need to give them a little bit more substance. So now at least I got this far, I can play with the shadows, which is something I wanted to do from the beginning. Uh, what kind of brush am I gonna use? Well, we've got some paint down. So I'm going to use something that's stiff. When they're stiff like this, they've got more control. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and add, it needs to be cooler, it needs to be darker. So what could I add right away? Well, I could add a little bit of green. I'm going to add it. If I just put this green right into that mixture, this is, this is what would happen. This is the same mixture I had on my palette that I have down there. That wouldn't work. So I want to gray it down a little bit by adding its complement. That almost might be too green. So I'll just try a little bit and see what happens. Actually, right, right where they meet, that's not that bad. Hmm. Not, not what I want, though. So I add a little bit of blue, a little bit of violet. Why did I choose the blue and violet? I wanted something that was cooler and uh, darker that would have a big impact. Okay, so right, right where they sit, yeah. Okay, right where they sit, that helps land that puppy. Now the shadow shape isn't quite right. I'll have to fix that, but that helps. And actually, this is probably not a good, a pointy brush is probably not good for what I'm doing right here. Okay, it needs to land here, but it can't be the same color as the cherry, or you're just not going to know where, where things start and where things stop. So I have to fix that. I either have to make this cooler or that warmer. Okay, so that's landing. That's starting to land here. That's better there. Let's see. Okay, that's better. I'm going to go ahead and darken that. But I need a big fat brush, just like we did that before when we were painting the shadow. I'm going right over the top with blue, doxazine purple. 
these puppies have to land. I'm leaving the center lighter because they would be. A little bit of red got in there, and I think that just makes it more interesting. That was a happy accident. And usually the outside of a shadow is darker than the edges are darker. Okay. We'll have to ground these two. Now I wasn't real careful about putting in the shadows and I added a lot of dark and a lot of red. Now they look like they're, they've landed. They're not floating quite so bad. They still could use a little bit more dark. But one thing that you are getting is a sense of space from these. Um, you can see that they're on a flat surface and you can see the space in between the stems and they're, they're working in the right direction. What I would do when I, what I'll do is I'm gonna let it dry in the studio and I will continue to make, let these have form. So this would definitely need to be a little more subtle. Right in here, that helps. Yeah, that's better. And uh, they're almost looking like these little peaches now, but they really are this color. So in the studio, I would take them home, maybe do a few more glazes over them, but I'm not gonna do a heck of a lot to them. So what I'll do is I'll bring them in next time, show you what I've done with them, and um, we'll take it from there. I hope you've enjoyed Give Your Wall Some Soul. And uh, next time I think we'll work on the figure and I may do some glazing of these so that you can see the next step right in person. Thanks for watching.